There are an estimated 46 million Americans living without health insurance today. Many of them hardworking people who live in neighborhoods like this one in Washington, D.C. If they have a baby, it can cost them between ten dollars and $15,000. In Canada, that cost would be zero. If they need a heart operation, they're looking at fifty dollars to $100,000, maybe mortgaging their home or going without the surgery. In Canada, that cost would be zero. Why is it that so many Americans have no insurance? Is it because the insurance companies have more money to lobby the politicians than they do? Forty percent of the bankruptcies in America are due to medical bills. I'm Tom Morris, and we'll examine this critical issue on The Real News. I think that when you talk about race and poverty, there are very few TV cameras in the ghetto on any given day. There are very few news crews in the projects and the housing projects and the trailer parks of America on any given day. The top 2% of the world's richest people own half of global wealth. A third of those people live in the United States. Yet nowhere in the most developed countries are poverty and homelessness as acute as in America. Coming soon, The Real News investigates. We are at a critical juncture now, and I don't think the younger generation that's not in Iraq fighting, the other, the, the P, I call them the PS2 kids. I have a son who's 22. He's, he's sitting around playing play, PlayStation and watching Cartoon Network and Adult Swim, and I'm telling him, I'm saying, look, man, you're not going to wake up till they say, we got to draft you, PlayStation boy, and we got to send you over there because we've run out of people that volunteered. And then, you're going to see what world you're living in, son. Yeah, we're at a critical time now. And if we don't pull, pull back from where we are, democracy as we know it, as in my firm belief, and this is not an apocalyptic view, or con, I'm not a conspiratorial-minded person, um, but when I see people snatched from other countries and taken places and tortured, and held for years without trial in the name of the United States of America, my country, and the nation, even the clergy of the nation, the nation's theologians for the last five years, to my knowledge, have not stood up and said to the government, excuse us, we aren't supposed to be doing this. There is a way to fight terrorism. Target the specific terrorist that targeted you. And that's it. Deal with them in a court of law. After Oklahoma City, the United States government did not go around and lock up every white militiaman from Michigan to Arizona, take them to Sanibel Island, put a prison there, and torture them. <laughs> that didn't happen. And that's where we are now. Up next, an investigative report on the U.S. Department of Homeland Security's program to generate terrorist ratings on tens of millions of travelers, including American citizens. Critics say the policy uses secret criteria to collect dossiers on individuals, all without any oversight. Will the program make us safer? Will innocent people have a way to get off the list? We investigate on The Real News. In my lifetime, I think we are at the most critical juncture that I've ever seen. Um, I was born in a segregated hospital in 1956 in Richmond, Virginia. I'm 50 years old, and I've seen a lot. I went through the 60s as a young kid with my father involved in the Civil Rights Movement. I grew up around people like Fred Shuttlesworth and Whitney Young and saw the sacrifices they made in the 60s. I saw people that went off to Vietnam that were a little older than me. I had a draft card. Fortunately, they were winding the war down and bringing people back as I was about to graduate from high school. But even those times, as dire as they seemed in the 60s and late, early 70s, pale in comparison to where we are now. September 11th, I was at the Pentagon covering it, watching it burn, experienced the horror of the day, um, went off to, was sent off to Cairo to do a story right after that about the history of Islamic fundamentalist terrorism and came back with a lot of perspectives on what the roots of what we now seem to be up against were. And the next thing I knew, we were headed down some other road, fighting other people that had nothing to do with anything that happened that day. And my civil rights were suddenly being eroded, and people were being locked up and tortured without trial in the name of my flag. And I watched my Congress sit back and say, 
uh, we, we just don't really know what to do. Uh, the executive branch has all the power now. We're trying to get it back, but we just don't know what to do. And the Supreme Court, you know, can't go to them anymore. <laughs> you know, habeas corpus, what's that?